Howdy folks, uh, this is Arizona Springtime and uh, we are now reaching uh, the last couple of chapters. This one uh, begins part four, <clears throat> Grand Canyon part two, Access, chapter 16, Accessing the Canyon through Human History. I have directly accessed the canyon through hiking and uh, photographing. But that limits my understanding of the canyon. Other people have accessed the Grand Canyon directly. As a photographer, artist, writer, poet, thrill seeker, explorer, hiker, or scientist. Still others have accessed the canyon as a place to live or as explorers on expeditions. My access to their experiences can take many forms such as reading scientific research, viewing art, and reading books. <clears throat> From those varied sources, I can start to form a new and broader understanding of the canyon I otherwise could never imagine. During the first hike in the canyon, Audrey and I found evidence of early residents there. We found the same humble ruins of human habitation that John Wesley Powell wrote about during one of his expeditions through the canyon. While standing at those ruins, we asked who were the first people to become part of the canyon. The early human history at the canyon sends us back in time to the ancient ones. They were the Cayenta Ancestral Pueblo, a subgroup of the broader Ancestral Pueblo that archaeologists have divided into six subgroups. Their earliest Ancestral Pueblo culture may have begun to thrive in the canyon over 5,000 years ago. Within the canyon around it are 3,000 Ancestral Pueblo sites, including 500 below the rim and those along the Colorado River. Many of the ancient sites have never been explored. The ancestral Pueblo built cliff dwellings for varied uses. A typical ancestral Pueblo site would have had to 50 people. Caloric requirements for the hunter-gatherers equaled close to 2,400 calories a day. Meat was hard to find, and 80% of their food came from plants. The early residents ate a wide variety of plants, including grasses, members of the sunflower family, amaranth, and lamb's quarters. When prickly pear fruit ripened, they harvested that and also mesquite pods. Plants also served as a source of medicine for ailments they suffered. Around 25% of their ancient medicinal plants are still used in modern medicines, either as a synthetic chemical compound found in plants or from parts of the plant. Their hunters sought the most available meat sources. Protein from animals supplemented their diet and included small mammals such as ground squirrels, rock squirrels, mice, as well as insects and birds. They also hunted for larger mammals such as deer and bighorn sheep. Highly desirable along the ancient trade routes located in the southwest was the trade in pottery. Fired clay was preferred over utilitarian baskets for cooking. The ancestral Pueblo cooks reduced the risk of contracting botulism and salmonella by cooking with pottery because clay cooked their foods at a higher temperature. Experts have identified individual pottery rim crimp styles, and although the ancient craftsperson's name is unknown, their creative handiwork is recognized. Potters had a sophisticated framework of business trade in pottery. Depending on its practical use, different shapes and materials were used to complete a piece. For example, coarser sand and crushed rock was added to clay for cooking vessels, so the finished piece would not crack when it was added to the, to the cooking fire. The challenge of the ancestral Pueblo is survival during a drought. Archaeologists believe that a prolonged drought in the 13th century forced ancestral Pueblo to abandon their cliff dwellings and change their building style to the modern Pueblo. After the ancient ancestral Pueblo abandoned the canyon, its, its, its existence did not fade from the Native American minds or stories. Pedro de Tobar, a member of the conquistadors who traveled with Francisco Vasquez de Coronado's expedition in 1540, documented that Native Americans spoke of a large river located to the west of the Hopi villages. Garcia Lopez de Cardenas was sent to investigate. Cardenas is considered to have been the first European to see the canyon. During the initial observation at the rim, Cardenas was disappointed in the very small river. 
a group was organized to walk to the Little River and report what they saw. As they began their walk, they soon discovered that the visual perspective had created an optical illusion and the true dimensions of the immense canyon became evident. The Europeans gave up the idea to march to the river. Then the canyon became terra incognita for centuries. It was not until the mid-1800s that non-native people sent expeditions to the west, including the canyon. Not quite the first American to see the canyon, John Wesley Powell was the first to put the canyon into the American mind. He was a veteran of the Civil War and severely wounded during the Battle of Shiloh. The injury cost him an arm. The plucky pioneer wasn't slowed by his disability. In 1869, he led the first scientific expedition to attempt passage through the entire Grand Canyon on the, Col on the Colorado River. He wrote about his plan, quote, the exploration was not made for adventure, but purely for scientific purposes, geographic and geologic, and I had no intention of writing an account of it, only of recording the scientific results, end quote. After his successful traverse of the canyon, he explored it again in 1870, 71, and 72. It was not until 1895 that he was compelled to write a popular account of his expeditions. The book was based upon, quote, my daily journal that had been kept on long and narrow strips of brown paper, which were gathered into little volumes that were bound in sole leather in camp as they were completed, end quote. Powell's inaugural expedition sent out on May 24, 1869 with nine others. One left the expedition earlier. Only six would survive the next 95 days and 1,000 miles as they traveled in wooden dairies. Three members left the expedition while in the canyon and were never heard from again. Along the way, Powell would give names to some of the famous lookouts, points, and promontories. Later, he became the second director of the United States Geological Survey. There is no doubt that Powell added valuable scientific and American cultural education with his accurate and inspired descriptions of the canyon. His reports gave Americans the chance to begin to understand the wildly diverse nature of the canyon. Little known outside the world of Arizona history researchers are the accounts of people who that traveled into the canyon prior to Powell. One of those was mountain man James Ohio Patty. His philosophy of the western country was shared by many Americans, both historic and contemporary. He believed the west was an untapped natural resource. He could take from nature with impunity and cash in. He could trap or trade for pelts and profit from it. He had no patience for anything that did not, did not lead to his monetary gain. His reminiscences were gathered in 1833 by Timothy Flynn. There are accounts that seem fanciful and others seem accurate. With an incomplete historical record, Patty is believed to be the first American-born person of European descent to view the Grand Canyon. He gave a less than impressed account. Quote, on the 28th, March 1826, we reached a point of the river where the mountains stood in so close upon its shores that we were compelled to climb a mountain and travel along the acclivity. The river is still in sight and an immense depth beneath us. Through this whole distance, as the river meanders, we had snow from a foot to 18 inches deep. The river bluffs on the opposite shore were never more than a mile from us. It is perhaps this very long and formidable range of mountains which has caused this country of the Colorado River to not have been more explored, at least by the American people. A march more gloomy and heart-wearing to people hungry, poorly clad, and mourning the loss of their companions cannot be imagined. Our horses had picked the little herbage and subsisted on the bark of shrubs. Our provisions were running low, and we expected every hour to seeing our horses entirely give out. April 10th, we arrived where the river emerges from these horrid mountains, which deprive all human beings of the ability to descend to its banks and make use of its waters." End quote. Although Patty had confused canyons with mountains, he did not enjoy the canyon as I or many others have. The canyon deprived Patty of beaver pelts. After Patty and before Powell, was the hotly debated and treacherous excursion through the canyon by James White. His harrowing trip began in the summer of 1867, 
with two others as a member of a small prospecting party. They began a western trek following rivers flowing through southwestern Colorado. Arriving at the rising walls of the canyon, the prospectors were unable to continue traveling along the Colorado River. They opted to relocate to the rim. Continuing west, they were ambushed by Native Americans and one companion was killed. The two survivors made their way down to the inner gorge of the Colorado River. The neighbor of Native Americans did not follow them, but the two men were too afraid to continue the trip along the rim. They decided to construct a log raft and float down river. White's companion was eventually swept away during an encounter with violent waves in mid-rapids. White recounted he survived the ordeal by eating mesquite beans at several stops. It's believed by some historians that he passed through the inner gorge in about 14 days. He emerged emaciated and nearly naked after his clothing had been ripped to shreds. He was rescued as he floated past Colville, now under the waters of Lake Mead. After his rescue and to this day, many do not believe he could have survived a trip through the canyon. Some historians believe he was in the canyon for a few days after the attack on the rim. White himself never made a big deal of the brutal ordeal. He was interviewed by another man who sent the account for publication in a scientific journal. It was through the publication that the trip became widely known. White later moved to Colorado and he lived in Trinidad until his death in 1927 at the age of 89. After the early accounts, Western migration eventually brought pioneers to the Grand Canyon. One of those was William Wallace Bass. He emigrated from Shelbyville, Indiana, and in 1883 landed in northern Arizona in the town of Williams. In 1884, during a hunting trip, Bass was guided by a Native American named Captain Burrow. He led Bass to a spring hidden near the south rim. Bass named the oasis Mystic Spring because, although he had heard about it, until he found it, he was skeptical of its existence. With a claim to precious water secured, he built Bass's Camp, a tourist spot. After blazing a trail, he named simply Mystic Spring Trail. His camp was the first attempt to draw tourists to the natural phenomenon. For income, he worked a small mining claim near the camp. Bass added a stagecoach after the railroad was built to the canyon in 1902. The stage met passengers at Bass Station, five miles southwest of today's Grand Canyon Village. In 1908, he built an aerial ferry across the gorge of the Colorado River. The ferry was a cage that hung from a cable. It could carry horses, cattle, sheep, and people. When Bass was 84 years old, he sold his camp to the Santa Fe Land and Improvement Company. Another of the early pioneers and entrepreneurs at the canyon was John Hance. Captain, as he was affectionately called, had been in the Civil War on the Confederate side, but when he was taken prisoner, he switched to the Union. In 1884, Hans homesteaded on the South Rim. Like Bass, Hans was at the canyon to prospect and earn income from mining efforts. He also recognized the potential of the canyon as a tourist destination. In 1894, Hans located an old trail that he widened. After that trail was wiped out by rock slides, he built a new trail into the canyon that he named New Hans's Trail. He built a log cabin as the first of his planned tourist accommodations. He was a fixture at the canyon and was appointed the first postmaster at Tourist, the name for the post office at the canyon. After the arrival of the first rail and automobile tourists, the Grandview Hotel was built by Pete Berry. He was the same person that built the original accommodations, now named Phantom Ranch. In 1892, he constructed the Grandview Trail, not for tourists, but as a pack trail for copper ore. He had found veins of the valuable mineral on Horseshoe Mesa in 1890. His last chance mine operated until 1907 when the price for copper collapsed. After the pioneer period of a variety of explorers seeking adventure, pleasure, or science have hiked into the Grand Canyon. Among the recent canyon visitors is the first person to hike the canyon below the rim end to end, Colin Fletcher wrote his accounts in The Man Who Walked Through Time, published in early 1968. The book became a landmark work in America during the Back to the Land movement of the 1960s and 1970s. Fletcher's first view of the canyon, 
came during a trip from New York to the West Coast. He and a friend had taken a brief detour for a quick look at the Grand Canyon. Upon arrival, Fletcher was awestruck by the incomprehensible depth that he had never known to exist before that moment. He marveled at the subtle shades of color that lay before him as he scanned the panorama. He also knew there was a master plan involved. He could see it. He admitted he did not know exactly when he began to think about a walk through the entire canyon. By late afternoon, he went to the visitor center to begin inquiring. He desperately tried to find out if anyone had been able to traverse the length of the canyon under the rim. Staff could not answer his question, nor could it be determined if water was available below the rim. He was further frustrated after they advised him they did not know if it was possible to walk end to end below the rim. Later, after finding the right person, he finally learned there was plenty of vegetation under the rim, and that meant the possibility of water. He decided to walk out to a point where there were no other tourists and sit under a juniper tree. It was there that he formed his vision to walk in the Grand Canyon from one end to the other. He researched and pieced together the epic height. Fletcher did walk along the canyon under the rim from one end to the other. His journey brought recognition to a new generation of hiking, that hiking was not just for adventure, pleasure, or science, but that hiking could include meditative and contemplative qualities. For the adrenaline crowd, there's plenty to access the Grand Canyon, but adventure and thrills can be defined various ways. One way is to hike the canyon, and in the case of Colin Fletcher, he walked the entire canyon. His book contains a lot of advice, at least at the beginning, for any future walkers or hikers. At the time the book was published in the late 1960s, there were a few modern guides to follow in preparing for a hike. Without his practical advice, anyone seeking exploration through hiking would have had little to go on. Fletcher's hike was without the benefit of any prior knowledge. He admitted he brought along such useless things as a rain poncho and a flashlight. He also brought practical items and explained his choice of stove, an ultralight white sleeping bag, boots, and the foods he chose for the trip. For example, dehydrated apples. He explained how he scheduled for food and supply drops. Those drops were his lifeline for a successful trek. At one point during his sojourn, snow began to fall. It happened to coincide with a scheduled supply drop. He stuffed himself under an overhang as piercing sleep began falling. It continued for another two hours. He hoped it was not too late for the pilot to drop his supplies. He attempted to signal the pilot by using a small mirror to reflect the sun. He also spread out his conveniently bright orange sleeping bag. The drop was successful and he could continue his trek once again, completely isolated from the outside world. Accessing the canyon does not have to mean walking. Rafting and muleback trips continue to be a popular way to witness the spectacular beauty. David Owen, who later spent a long time with the river, took his family to see the national parks in Utah and the Grand Canyon. They chose to embark on a one-day rafting trip meant specifically for families. The trip would only raft through calm waters and bypass the thrill-seeker rapids and cataracts. Later, while he researched his book about the complicated water laws involving the Colorado River, he interviewed river runners and raft company owners. They explained to him that the completion of Glen Canyon Dam tamed the great Colorado River. One of the consequences to the canyon was invasive plant species that had taken hold in the canyon. They said originally the unpredictable water levels on the untamed Colorado River meant that occasional floods ripped through the canyon and the invaders uh, would have been exterminated. Now the hand of man has caused the invaders to take an unnatural hold and there is no natural recourse to rid the canyon of them. Edward Abbey, Abbey gave an indication of a type of canyon trip he enjoyed when he wrote an essay titled Up the Creek with the Down River Rowdies. In the essay, Abbey fancifully portrayed himself at the time as a ranger. He was asked to join an expedition at the last moment. He exclaimed to the boat operator that he could not join them because he would get fired. The operator of the boat opened a can of beer and replied, who cares? 
so Abby joined the expedition after giving his boss 30 seconds notice. His canyon trip continued with the original impromptu feel. Joseph Woodcrutch took a trip into the canyon via muleback. The mules often stopped on the trail where plant material was growing. He subtly explained that the riding mules only accepted a slight knee in the ribs as incentive to, to continue. He sagely advised it was dangerous to knee the mule too much since they walked the trail perilously close to the edge. He then described the various drop-offs and where in geologic history you would land. Abby, Crutch, and Fletcher wrote timeless books. Each has the flavor of experience made individual by their superb writing. All of the books mean that the author's expression of access to the canyon can become a reader's access as well. So ends this chapter. We'll see you for the next and final chapter.